your rip you wait your entire adult life for right here. Get the feeling running down your arms, into your fingers. This is what life's all about. It's gonna be a place for the faint of heart to stay at home. So stay at home if you don't want to get hit. Time to get back on the top. Starting the day. We got a battle today. But we are for it. We owe him so bad. Can't spit it out yet. No, we gotta stop the run and get on that quarterback, man, because there ain't no way he's gonna beat us. Get everybody that football now. Nobody lost. Everybody going full speed. Okay, man. If the game has been waiting for, let's go out and play the way we can. Let's go! Take the sting out of these guys. Boats loaded, man. Let's roll. One, two, three. Hit the knees. Pass, pass, pass. So welcome to the NFL here like him, baby. <laughs> Okay, and don't say a word. If you do it one more time, I'll say it and block him, all right? Don't talk to him. Just block him. Hey, you got to make some big plays. Do it! You just out of two Good. now. The 19 and that one. You had room, everybody in the sideline hollered. Come on, take a shot at it. Let's go. Terrible running. That's terrible running. The wheel's out on the slot. Get your ass up field. Somebody's got to beat a guy. We got to play this like it's tooth and nail right down to the end. Tighten it up now. Tighten it up. Get up. We can break their will and we can take them out, man. The foot race is underway. Near side breaks the 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 45, 40. He may go all the way. He looks, fires for the corner of the end zone. Martin makes the catch. Long after the cheering has faded, the sights and sounds of NFL 91 remain fixed in our memories. Hi, I'm Steve Saber. And when I think back to 1991, I think of a season highlighted by individual brilliance. Buffalo's Thurman Thomas, Detroit's Barry Sanders, Houston's Warren Moon. It was a season inspired by the courageous team effort of the Detroit Lions, a performance in the face of tragedy that will never be forgotten. And above all, it was the year of the Washington Redskins, a winning organization shaped by a man fast gaining recognition as one of the very best head coaches of all time. It's time for Super Bowl 26. After two weeks of gassing about football, we finally get to play some football. Let's get to it. Since 1981, only the San Francisco 49ers have won more NFL games than the Washington Redskins. And the reason is quite simple. That was the year Joe Gibbs became Washington's head coach. Griffin back to pass on a quick shot. Throws it in the near flat to Biner at the five. Dies for the corner. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. Back he goes. Good protection again. Going deep. He's got Clark in the end zone. Redskins. In Super Bowl 26, the Redskins reigned all over Buffalo's parade, then toasted the man whose common sense approach to handling people has made him a coaching giant. What we're going to do here that's different is we're all going to go up or we're all going to go down together, and there's not going to be any you 
or me pointing fingers and you're not going to read in the paper where I'm criticizing you and I don't want to read in the paper where you're criticizing me. And Redskins as a group are all going up or we're all going down and we're going together. And they talked about this being their Super Bowl. Hey, expect that kind of effort. Expect a great effort from them. And every single swinging guy starts with teams. Let's hit it rolling now. Let's earn this thing today. Nothing gets away from us. Let's earn it today, okay? Ultimately, Joe Gibbs does things in a rational way, and his players, uh, they like that. Too much is made of people who are task masters, who dominate their players. I think the element of being a decent man ultimately comes back to help you. His decency exhibits itself in many ways. In 1986, Gibbs helped create a home for wayward teenagers called Youth for Tomorrow, a safe haven for young citizens with troubled lives yearning to rediscover positive virtues through interaction and teamwork. As a young person, Gibbs himself enjoyed building race cars, everything from soapbox racers to dragsters. Today, he owns a racing team, another outlet for his competitive fire. And yet for a man living in the fast lane, he remains remarkably even-tempered, which is what makes his rare emotional outbursts so memorable. We were down 14 to nothing, and we're about to go into the playoffs. And I, I, can, remember, I can remember walking in that door, and Joe was beat red, He's taken all the drinks. You go, he's, he's in, and I probably shouldn't say this, but his exact quote was, playoff team my ass, bam. And the next thing you know, the oranges were flying, and everybody was in shock. And it was, we couldn't get out of that locker room soon enough. And I mean, in the first five minutes, it's 14 to 14, and we went on to eventually win the game. With 10 or more victories in eight of his 11 pro seasons, Gibbs' winning percentage is second only to Don Shula among active NFL coaches. They've been up there so long, you look for that one consistent thread, and it's the, the most obvious one is Joe Gibbs. He's gone to the Super Bowl with three or four different quarterbacks. Uh, you know, no other coach can say that. Some say it's the system that turns quarterbacks into champions with the Redskins. Gibbs believes good men make the system work. I hear people talking about he's got a great arm and things like that. I think the thing is the quarterback is he has to have great character, be a great person. He's got to have a burning desire as a competitor. And I think the third thing is they have to be extremely tough. Joe Gibbs recognized these qualities in quarterback Mark Rippon at a time when others were questioning Rippon's big league credentials. Gibbs definitely brings it out of Rippon. The fact that they had confidence in him when a lot of people didn't. The fact that Gibbs sticks with quarterbacks and doesn't listen to fans or writers or people like me. That's what makes a quarterback confident and makes him perform well. Back to the left side with Monk and Clark. Back goes Rippon. Throws it in the end zone. Clark, touchdown, Washington Redskins. After six straight losses to the New York Giants. And throws it long for Clark at the five. Grabs it. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. The Redskins put the Giants' jinx behind them, then rolled to 17 wins in 19 regular and postseason games. A classic example of superior resources and Coach Gibbs' winning designs. Sometimes, as soon as you see that game plan, you know when it's going to work because his enthusiasm putting it in. So when we go out there on Sunday, we know one thing during the course of the week that we've been given the best possible way to, to go out and perform. Physically, that's, that's our turn to go after it then. The best thing about our football team last year, that team last year understood itself. And I think it believed that every week when we went out there, they could be beaten. Anybody could have beaten that team last year, and they could beat anybody. But I tell you, until you get a team where they can grab that, you may have problems. No such problems for Gibbs and the Redskins, a team long on both old-fashioned values and Super Bowl victories. Even in triumph, Joe Gibbs remembered to share the glory.
So who are the challengers in the NFC? In Atlanta, the cocky Falcons jiggle to a rhythm unlike any other team. And when these bad boys strut their stuff, it's a sight to behold. Steps on the 50. Makair gives it to Dion. 35, 30, 25, 20, 10. In the corner, touchdown, Dion! In 1991, the Falcons adopted Hammer. And his too legit to quit philosophy proved prophetic as Atlanta reached the playoffs for the first time in nine years. Touchdown! We roll it out! We roll it out! Crank your ass up! Come on, come on! The frantic Falcons like to live on the edge, something they inherited from head coach Jerry Glanville. Are you scary? I'm not scared. Are you frightened? I'm fighting. I'm not frightened. You're I'm fighting. Are you afraid? Never been afraid in your life? Never. I love you. Especially since you've been here. <laughs> what I ask the team to do, and this may shock some fans out there, we really don't ask them to win a football game. Uh, we play as hard as we can play. And we don't leave any I wish I had's on the field. I wish I'd done this, like, or if, or if I'd have done this. We leave all that behind us. We play as hard as we can play. And then we'll live with the results. You got to do everything right today, darling. But you got to have fun doing it. We just go have fun and play ball. Play well. That's all we got to do. For all their playfulness, the talented Falcons are serious contenders whose reckless abandon makes them, on any given day, the NFL's most dangerous team. We're on the right, we're going Hail Mary. There goes Tolliver, a long, high pass, down in the corner, batted. They fight. Touchdown! 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 Ungodly! My God, somebody caught the ball. While the Falcons found harmony with their fun and games, it was a tragedy in Detroit that inspired the Lions to their finest season in over 30 years. In November, a freak injury paralyzed starting guard Mike Utley. Incredibly, his positive thumbs-up gesture and subsequent courage during rehabilitation served to inspire and strengthen his teammates' resolve. nothing to be afraid of. I got injured and that's the way it goes. So every day is a new day for me. That's the way I look at it. You know, I'm not gonna quit living just because I can't, you know, right now walk. And I can see the team say, my God, uh, if this guy can go through this, uh, let's do it for him. And uh, uh, a lot of teams that go through these type things, I think go downhill. Uh, we went uphill. It was a thing that uh, I think brought not only the Detroit Lions uh, football team together, the whole organization became one organization. I think it was uh, uh, because of Mike Utley. Mike, we know you're listening. On behalf of your teammates, the fans, and the players, and the coaches, we want you to know that you are as big a part of this team today as you have ever been and that you will be always be a part of this team. Thanks for your courage, your inspiration, and your strength. We're all praying for you. We're all pulling for you. So keep the faith. We love you. And thumbs up, Mike. We love you. Aaron to the right of the formation. Kramer pulls away, looks to pass. He looks, he looks. Right side throws. This one is caught. From the moment they dedicated their season to Mike Utley, the Lions took on a whole new identity. The Lions raced to five straight victories and proved that they didn't always have to rely on Barry Sanders to pull out a game. Back to throw, out, Davis, one hand, intercepted by Sheldon White! Touchdown, Lions! Can you believe it? In their first ever playoff in the Silver Dome, Mike Utley. Mike Utley's heroic spirit lifted the Lions to a stunning, lopsided victory over the Cowboys. Fires it in, open great, touchdown, Lions, Willie Gray, his second of the day. And what a pass by Eric Kramer. Are headed 
to the NFC Championship. Do you believe it? Although Wayne Font's Lions had doused Dallas, it is the Cowboys under head coach Jimmy Johnson who potentially have the greatest collection of talent in the NFC. Everybody's sharp now, everybody's sharp. And off Smith, and left tackle pops out to the 30, a block from right, gets into the 40, breaking right to the 45, to midfield, Smith to the 40. Young Emmett Smith led the NFL in rushing, while Michael Irvin topped all receivers in aerial yardage. The Cowboys appear to be born again in the 90s after having lost faith and many games in the 80s. Those days are over with. It's not going to be, here it goes again, 47 guys believing, 47 guys hanging in there for four quarters. Believe in each other, believe in each other, make plays, make plays, swarm, pursue, and let's play our defense, guys, let's sit this in. If the Cowboys improved themselves on defense, and the draft was dedicated to just that, there is no telling how far this abundantly talented team can go. I don't think a team has distinguished itself yet as being a team of the 90s. If I were to pick one right now going into this season and going into the next few seasons, I'd say the Dallas Cowboys. They've got the quarterback number one. They've got the running back number two. They're building a very nice offensive line. They're going to address some defensive weaknesses they've had. And I think they've got some tremendous young players, very young average age on the team. And I think if there's one team that's going to distinguish itself, at least that we see now, it's the Cowboys. No rush, and they are big penning it to the end zone. This will be a prayer up in the air, and it might be, it's, it might be caught. It's a touchdown. Oh, big bill struck. Super job of working. A hey, super job of believing, just like what we talked about at practice. Hey, you know, when you ever go after a big gorilla, you don't ever hit him lightly. You hit him with everything you got. Yeah! In 1991, the Cowboys took their first major steps towards regaining their pride as America's team. Look for them in 1992 to keep strutting their stuff. The Washington Redskins face an uphill battle to repeat, not only as Super Bowl champions, but as winners of their own conference. As many as six teams could dethrone the Redskins in what is a very strong NFC. In the AFC, however, things are different. There doesn't appear to be a, a Dallas Cowboys or a Atlanta Falcons ready to take that next step. Now this bodes well for the Buffalo Bills, who despite two straight Super Bowl defeats are clearly the class of the conference, with fans who give new meaning to the term home field advantage. Noise becomes like a separate element. It becomes like a liquid almost. It's as though you're walking through water or something. It, it doesn't go up and down. It's just a sheer volume. So if you talk to some players and they really think about it, they'll say, I didn't hear the noise, but I, did, I had no sense of hearing whatsoever. You're, the sense of sound, of hearing, disappears entirely. So you're down to four senses instead of five. It's almost like they're silenced because it is so deafeningly loud. Hutt Stadium has erupted in pandemonium. If you're going to go to Rich Stadium, I mean, you've got to be a little bit nuts. And I think that helps because the players are all a little bit nuts. We all know that. Keep it up now, D. Keep it up. And if you got fans that are a little bit nuts, that can't do anything but help you. Nice head. Nice head. Woo! You don't see people like that where their lives are so tied up into one thing, and that's success of the Bills. Last year, I'm walking into the stadium, and there's a pig dressed as a Buffalo Bill. It has a Bill's uniform on, little Bill's cleats, little Bill's helmet. And 
you know, things painted on them. They're so hungry, and they want a winner so bad. I mean, they're great fans, tremendous, vociferous fans. But I think of the ones I've seen over the last few years, Buffalo's win. You can hear. And if somebody cups their hands like this and directs it right at you, even if you got your helmet on, you got ear holes here, and if they aren't taped over, you can hear what they're saying. Let's get them, baby! We're going to win this game, man! I know there have been more than a few players who have responded to the crowd. There comes a limit to what you can take. You're getting shut out today, Clayton. Oh, sit down and shut up. In the last two years, no team has sold more tickets and scored more points than Buffalo. With their frantic no-huddle attack, they fill up the stadium and run up the score. Hurry it up, hurry it up, hurry it up, hurry. We better hurry. In the no-huddle offense, Kelly to throw again. Hurry it up, hurry it up, hurry it up. Hurry. We better hurry. Quarterback Jim Kelly is the playmaker in an NBA-style fast-break offense that has run up an astounding 886 points, nearly 28 a game over the last two seasons. Versatile Thurman Thomas, Andre Reed, and ageless James Lofton. Too many weapons. Kelly will throw on first. Let's it go long down the field, and it is taken by Lofton at the I just followed you. Down I saw your stick move. The guy's still standing out there. Good job. In the AFC Championship game, the battle hardened Broncos and Bills were locked in an embrace that neither could escape. Neither could score, and neither backed down. Buffalo's no huddle went nowhere, yet somehow the Bills reached deep, and like true champions, they found a way to win. Fasten your seatbelt, and he's going back to throw. A little screen pass, batted down and intercepted by Carlton Bailey. He runs in for the touchdown. He runs in for the score, and the Bills are going back to the Super Bowl. It is Mission Minneapolis. They just seemed to come into that game uh, off kilter, and then. The weakness was they, they couldn't uh, protect Kelly. They had no pocket to step up into. He had too much gut pressure. He had to work the perimeters, look for his hot receivers, and he couldn't get there because he had no pocket. They're going to have to firm up on both sides of the ball, the middle, and get a little tougher. I don't know how many times you can muster everything and get close and not do it. James Lofton can't stay young forever. Thurman Thomas might not stay healthy forever. Jim Kelly takes a beating as a quarterback. Bruce Smith's got a bad knee. Marv Levy's getting old. How long is he going to stay enthused about all this? He may want to go back to teaching English somewhere. But you got to try to get back there again. And I don't know, that's asking an awful lot for three years in a row, an awful lot. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Buffalo Bills football. Buffalo's fans make the future full of sound and fury. What it signifies is up to the Bills. And it is pandemonium at Rick Stadium. While the Denver Broncos still appear to be good enough to win at least the AFC, they are a team about which Butch Cassidy's famous question might be asked, who are these guys? There's a team that seems to always have kind of a tenuous hold um, on, on greatness, and that's Denver. Hey, we know what's about. We know what we're here for. All business, all business. And they played so well defensively last year, especially in the playoff game at Buffalo, that there's a tendency to say, are these guys for real? I got it up. Go get him. Go 
clumsy idiot. Nick dummy. And they allowed the fewest touchdowns in the NFL last year. And that's a tremendous record. You ain't catch none of that on me today. The hardest beat for the Broncos this season could be maintaining this defensive excellence. The dominant ingredient that turned the Broncos from a last place loser in 1990 to a 12-4 Western Division champion. I kind of was puzzled about what they did last year. I don't know where they came from. Maybe they caught people napping a little bit. Uh, maybe the schedule was a little weaker. But they seem to have gotten their resolution back, and they seem to play with emotion and intensity. <laughs> The Broncos will also need another emotional and intense season from number seven, quarterback John Elway. Right, 16 rush for a win seven. Few quarterbacks can beat you in as many different ways as Elway. And it seems the division rival Kansas City Chiefs have witnessed all of them. Including this third and 17 extravaganza that led to a last minute Denver victory. He's going to let it go long, and Mark Jackson is there. 50, 45, 40, 35. Those kind of plays don't surprise me with Elway, because he has a great presence. You'll notice that the great quarterbacks don't usually get called very much for stepping over the line. They scramble up, but they always know where that marker is. So they're functioning at top efficiency, mentally and physically, in, in, a, in a huge crisis situation. Elway scrambles away, and he'll run. He's up, passes on the move. Cut. Elway's a guy who always finds the right thing to do. Better than anybody else. Does that better than anybody else? In my opinion, he's he's a great quarterback. He's a Hall of Fame quarterback. And if you just look at Super Bowl victories, that, that's that's not the way to judge quarterbacks. Denver at the two-yard line. They're 98 yards away from six, but they don't. Perhaps the best way to judge quarterbacks is how they perform when a game or perhaps even an entire season is at stake. Damn. It's the game right here, four for six, it's the game. In that category, John Elway has few equals. Elway, he's got some time, flushed out, rolls out, being chased. Here's Elway, first down at the 35-yard line. Yeah! We needed that. We needed that, boy. In the playoffs, the Houston Oilers learned that there is always a way with John Elway, especially on fourth down. And this time, 10. 16 on one. On one. Hurry up! Faced with his third fourth down play of the game, Elway reached deep into his pocket full of miracles to pull out his most spectacular play. God dang, come on! Here's the fourth down and 10 play. Elway's got the ball. John is back, runs up out of the pocket, lets the pass go, it's caught. Denver finally won it on a field goal. Broncos lead 26 to 24. This place is a madhouse. 76,000 plus have lost their minds at Mile High Stadium. In 1992, the Denver Broncos will once again pin their hopes and dreams on the poise and daring of its unique quarterback. Elway plus defense. It's a formula that has carried Denver to the threshold of a world championship four times in six seasons, and one they expect will carry them all the way to the top in 1992. At age 35, 1991 may have been Warren Moon's last shot at a Super Bowl. At the time, it was pretty devastating, but we still either talk about it or joke about it every now and then that we should have never let that game get away from us and we just hope that game somewhere down the line doesn't haunt us. While the Oilers have yet to win the big one, they escaped from what could have been their biggest loss. If Kevin Gilbride had gotten the Pittsburgh Steelers job, I don't know that Houston would have continued the run and shoot the way it had been running without Gilbride. And in a sense, uh, Gilbride not taking that job, I think, really 
allowed the run and shoot to continue for another year. In the three seasons Gilbride's tutored Moon, the Oilers have fielded the NFL's top-rated passing offense. The emphasis, as opposed to most offenses, where you start with run, run, run to set up the pass, it's the exact reversal that uh, you, you pass, pass, pass. In 1991, it seemed all the Oilers ever did was pass. In an overtime victory against Dallas, Moon connected on 41 of 56 for over 400 yards, but didn't throw a single touchdown pass. Most people look at this offense as a big play offense, and all we're going to do is score points really quickly. Because of the way it's evolved, they're playing a lot of zone defense, which forces us to uh, throw a lot of shorter passes. I think generally I only usually get through two to three of the receivers uh, as far as my progression is concerned. The call guy on a route, the main receiver on a route, might have four to five options, depending on what it is he wants to do. A signal alerts Moon to which option was chosen, but basically the rule is, run where the defender isn't. If it's zone, pull up underneath. If it's man-to-man, -man, go the distance. Back to pass is Moon, looking deep for Tony Jones! Toast! Oh, Toast. baby, what a Toast. throw! Run and shoot employs four receivers that stretch the defense. One receiver occupies the underneath coverage, keeping linebackers from getting a deep drop in the secondary. This gives the passer an unobstructed path to another receiver in the same zone. It's an offense based on pattern precision. The cut is very, very important because we do a lot of speed cuts here, and uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, you don't need to do speed cuts if that's bad, but we do a lot of speed turns and we just get to the open spot. We have to be on the same page as a quarterback and then run and shoot style of offense. Okay, if we get blitzed, everybody break their route off, all right? And uh, if you're not, you know, he can throw an interception, you can make a bad read, and it makes like, you know, neither one of you know what you're doing. Receivers are required to read coverages and alter routes. One wrong turn can spell disaster. A lot of times the coaches don't know, pretty much know what Warren is doing out there because Warren changes a lot of plays in the huddle, you know. I'm going back Ryan, you know. All right, you don't get too wide on this 81X curl special. You're in the flat, right? There's certain routes that I might ask, uh, say, Haywood on a certain option. On that he 91 might have. hook, they gave us two zones, so be ready to settle down out there on the sideline. Instead of giving him the option, I'm just going to tell him to do exactly what I want him to do. Sometimes the adjustment was applied immediately. Okay, now if I throw the hitch, I might throw it outside. Yeah. When you come, when, when you hitch, the ball yeah. might be out there. Like yeah. Other times, it took a week. Moon with plenty of time. Down the far side, dunk it, touchdown! You know, we try and stay to the basics, but we have a pretty good communication now to where we can do those types of things and get away with them. For the last five years, Moon has led the Oilers to the playoffs, but in 1992, he'll turn 36. The question is, um, how, how much does Warren Moon have left? At the age when most quarterbacks put their pads away, the Oilers are counting on Moon to pass them into the postseason one more time. The run and shoot has helped Warren Moon become one of the best quarterbacks in pro football, and some believe that when this offense is clicking on all cylinders, possible to stop. One thing for sure though, defenders who face the run and shoot really earn their money. And there are few defenders in pro football who earn more money than Pat Swilling. Is Swilling really the NFL's best defensive player? And for that matter, who's the game's most explosive offensive player? Oklahoma State's Thurman Thomas or Oklahoma State's Barry Sanders? Choosing between two great backs is one difficult assignment. Barry Sanders versus Thurman Thomas is a tough one. Thurman Thomas is more productive, Barry Sanders is more spectacular, but he's not as great a running back as Thurman Thomas because he doesn't contribute as much. The thing that's different about Thurman Thomas is he's very elusive, he's a very clever running back, and he's a great receiver. I'm not sure Barry Sanders is a great receiver. Dropping back against the zone, he throws Thurman Thomas! Thomas on the touchdown. 
you got a guy in the backfield like Thurman that uh, keep the defense guessing, oh, were they going to run the football or are they going to pass the ball? But if they pass it, they also have Thurman there. So you have to make sure that he's accounted for, too. And if you don't put a guy one-on-one -on, -one on Thurman Thomas, he's going to make a big play. Thomas has topped the NFL in total yards from scrimmage for the past three seasons. And 1991 marked the second straight year that this Oklahoma State product led the AFC in rushing. He has, the, to, in my mind, the single most important quality of uh, a great running back, and that is balance. He can be hit, and you don't topple him, you move him to the side. Because of his great balance, he has the ability to cut. He has great discretion when to turn it on, when to go outside, when to cut it back, when to lunge forward. Here is Thurman Thomas. He breaks through at the 30, at the 35. When the down and distance require a clutch performance, some experts would rather call on Thomas's college teammate. If I had to give the ball to one of them on third and six, I'd give it to Barry Sanders. Sanders possesses a dazzling array of moves that seemingly defy the rules of physics and definitely deny the reach of defenders. Rodney Pete, draw to Barry. Barry skirts to the 15, looks for running room, cuts to the 10, he's to the 5, and the pick it in! Touchdown, Lions! Barry is a back all his own, you know. You get Barry and you contain him in a situation, and he just comes out of it. So Barry is somebody that you just, you, you hope you tackle him. It's not like you're going to go out and say, I'm going to put a good lick on him. You just hope you get him down. During his three-year NFL career, Sanders has rushed for over 4,300 yards and 43 touchdowns. At Oklahoma State, Sanders was a backup for Thurman Thomas. Now many believe he's the front runner among today's ball carriers with the potential to be the best ever. I think Barry Sanders is yet to be utilized the way he could be in an offense. And when he is, I would say he will be the greatest running back in the history of the game. And I, I'm including everybody, Jimmy Brown, uh, O.J. Simpson, Sayers, Peyton, you know, the whole nine yards. If he doesn't get hurt, he's the best I've ever seen. Barry Sanders has eye-popping talents. Thurman Thomas has all-purpose skills. Who's the most explosive weapon? Thomas has the correct answer. People ask me who's the best running back in the National Football League. Only answer I can give them is that I don't know, but I bet they're from Oklahoma State. The man who commands the NFL's defensive spotlight is Saints linebacker Pat Swilling. In 1991, Swilling demolished pass pockets with an explosive outside rush that produced a league-high 17 sacks. As an off-season free agent, Swilling became pro football's highest paid defender when New Orleans bettered a lucrative offer from the Lions. The Saints know that Swilling thrives in the Superdome because he's especially quick on turf and because a certain chant has replaced Dixieland Jazz on the Crescent City hit parade. Defense! Defense! Pat Swilling playing on artificial turf with crowd noise was devastating. Coming around the corner, I mean, he came like a, a freight train. But for some reason, Pat Swilling seems to have great half years. A lot of times he's had great second half of the year because he held out during the camp and didn't get his legs really right until a few games in. Last year he had a great first half of the year and then he tailed a bit. I think he plays with such intensity that he has to pace himself a little bit. But Swilling believes a torrid tempo produces a winning rhythm. I think it's, it's kind of sets the pace for you for a year. When you rush the pass as much as I do, you're always trying to get to the quarterback and you always want to get those sacks. That's a big thing among linemen, linebackers. You always try to get to quarterback and mount up as many trophies as, as you can. And trophies, I mean quarterbacks. You kind of try to look ahead for not only getting the sight, but also knocking the ball loose and hopefully enabling your team to win. Swilling's relentless approach to the game wreaks havoc upon opposing offenses. It is a standard pro set offense and a straight drop back for Craig. He wants to throw the ball, knock loose. It's flying around the 15 yard line. Looks like Swilling has it at the 10 to the 5. He's into the touchdown. A lot of people believe that Pat Swilling is worth his proverbial weight in gold. Well, in 1992, he'll have the paychecks to prove it.
Not every pro football moment is spectacular. Morey picks it up at the 15, moves forward, the oh. kick is blocked up into the air. Oh, that's football follies. Obstacles to success crop up unexpectedly. Competitive fires occasionally burn out of control. Oh, here comes the big, there comes a big piece of flame coming down. They're going to call timeout now. The officials have got to go burn the turf. This is the dangest thing I've ever seen in a football game right here. I've never seen anything like this either. Oh, here comes the Gatorade bucket. <laughs> and of course, hey, Dave. We all know who gets the blame. Hey, Bill! Bill! There was no whistle there when we got the ball! That's awful! You had the spot all the way, didn't you? We'll go down. Bull Official! Official! You just killed the quarterback! What's the penalty for? Let's get the flag out! The one's a bad call. And I was upset at that bad call over there until I saw your bad call. Your bad call trumped, trumped that bad call. What the hell's the problem? But in the final analysis, it's the unpredictability inherent in the game's human element that makes pro football such a smashing success. Line to the 5 